Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the International Methods Colloquium. Um, I am not Justin Estri, I'm pitch hitting today. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. Oh, incidentally, I'm Rick Wilson subbing for, for Justin. Uh, this week's speaker is uh, Clayton Webb of uh, the University of Kansas. The talk is entitled Dynamic Specification Issues for Pooled Time Series Data, a General to Specific Modeling Approach. Uh, the presentation is based on joint work with Sarah Mitchell at the University of Iowa. Clay's talk is uh, going to last about 30 to 40 minutes, after which point we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of the webinar window, and you may ask questions at any time during the talk, but all the questions will be held until the end of the presentation. I'll relay the questions on to Clay. A link to Clay's slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window, so you may refer to it throughout the presentation. Um, so now I'd like to welcome Clay Webb to the IMC. Take it away, Clay. All right. Um, my name is Clayton Webb. Uh, this is work I'm doing with Sarah Mitchell. The title of the paper is Dynamic Specification Issues for Pooled Time Series Data. So, uh oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, before we offer our characterization of dynamic specification strategies and time series cross-section data, uh, we want to begin with a series of propositions uh, about time series analysis that we think are rather non-controversial and serves the basis for our characterizations. So uh, proposition one is that time is continuous, but measurement is not. Social phenomena, politics, economics occur in continuous time, but we measure these continuous processes at discrete intervals, either yearly, monthly, daily, hourly, et cetera. Um, and even though uh, we often think of our time series as uh, representations of those data generating processes. These intervals are not characteristics of the data generating process, but are characteristics uh, of our measurement. And it, it's important because uh, the frequency is often chosen for us. Ideally, we would choose uh, our sampling intervals after we've developed our theory to get the sampling interval that's most appropriate to capture our theory. But most of the time we find ourselves in situations where we use data that are collected by others, or at least we have to modify our data, either aggregating our data or changing our sampling interval to accommodate variables that have been collected by other people. And that has important consequences. Um, the sampling interval affects the dynamics. Uh, temporal aggregation causes information loss, and both of those things can affect analysis and inference. So the dilemma that these propositions create for applied time series is that we are ostensibly experts on a variety of subjects, but we can't bring this expertise to bear on one of the key features of measurement. So in light of this dilemma, the question uh, posed is how can analysts identify dynamic models that best represent the hypothesized relationships that we're interested in when we don't have control over how those relationships are being measured? And the problem that we identify in the paper is that we actually have a well-established set of procedures for dynamic specification of single time series models, but those procedures are not being followed uh, in time series cross-section analysis. So um, to begin, we view dynamic specification as at least partially an empirical problem. Uh, we develop uh, theories about uh, independent and dependent variables, but those theories often lack temporal specificity. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if we have some cause and effect, the question becomes, uh, or a, a temporally specific theory would say that A causes B and the length of the delay between A and B uh, is equal to some interval. Um, and that's important for measurement because if B is instantaneous but fleeting and we have a delayed measure of B, then we're going to fail to observe B. Uh, or if B is delayed and we try and measure B in the short term, we're going to miss B as well. And often we don't think about this problem because most of our theories are agnostic about time. Uh, we say that consumer sentiment and presidential approval are related over time or the trade and conflict 
are related over time. Um, and we studied these things for a long time, so we have an idea about these relationships. Uh, but we know that um, based on different levels of temporal aggregation and sampling, uh, that these time series have different characteristics, whether they're quarter or measured quarterly or annually. Um, and approval and consumer sentiment, for example, are not quarterly or annual processes. So these features or the dynamic properties of, the, of those uh, variables are not uh, inherent uh, in approval and sentiment. There's something observed as a consequence of the way that we've measured the data. Um, and so in this view, dynamic specification is influenced by measurement uh, and we have an empirical problem where we want to choose the specification that best fits the data rather than trying to use our theory to describe how the data exists. And while we think that this is sort of a non-controversial way of thinking about the problem for single time series analysis, we don't think that these same approaches to dynamic specification are being followed in the TSCS literature. So we identify three uh, primary alternative views of dynamic specification in the time series cross-section literature. Um, the first is that time is sort of treated as a tool, and the question that gets asked is how many lags of x should I include in my model? Causal inference requires that x and y co-vary, but also that x is prior to y. And so some people have tried to use lags of x to imitate exogeneity. Um, the idea is that if I omit contemporaneous x, then I can be sure that uh, my, spe uh, my specification allows x to be uh, exogenous to y because x t minus 1 happens before y t because x t minus 1 occurred at t minus 1. Um, and then uh, individuals have become preoccupied with the question of how many lags of x do I need to include for x to be exogenous? Um, Cranner et al. Uh, refer to this as the atheoretic lag problem um, and go about dealing with different approaches to choosing the number of lags of x, one, two, three lags of x, depending on the problem that you're looking at. Um, and we think that this approach misunderstands dynamic relationships. x and y are continuous processes, and uh, we can't decide whether or not x, t, and y, t are related. They either are or they are not. And if xt is part of the data generating process, we know that omitting xt causes bias. Plumber, Troger, and Manow also sort of uh, broach this subject and point out that um, one lag uh, doesn't sort of make much sense in this context, because why would we assume that one lag would be sufficient uh, delay for all processes in politics or across all countries. Um, so there's nothing, uh, the, the, this idea of lagging x uh, doesn't sort of ensure uh, exogeneity, it just introduces the possibility that you're going to get biased estimates. The second common approach that we see uh, is that time is treated as a nuisance. Um, and the question that gets asked is how many lags of y should I include, or rather, should I include a lag? Uh, so the nuisance approach uh, misunderstands uh, the problem of serial correlation. So um, serial correlation is a symptom, uh, not a disease. Uh, it typically reflects something in specification or measurement. If you open a textbook about time series analysis or an econometrics textbook, all the reasons that we observe serial correlation have to do with misspecification of functional form, the omission of important variables or important lags, um, or data manipulation and data aggregation. And, and so in that sense, you can think of uh, the analyst is inserting themselves into the data generating process by altering the data. So it's not so, something that you can control for unless you include a variable that explains that serial correlation. And if you focus on correcting the residuals, uh, you may leave your model incorrectly specified. Um, and, and that's sort of important. Not all types of dynamic misspecification are equally problematic. If you include more lags uh, of X and Y, um, it might create multicollinearity, but your estimates are still going to be unbiased. If you omit important lags of X and Y, uh, your uh, estimation and inferences are going to be affected in, a, in sort of a bigger way. Um, a third uh, approach that we often see in TSCS literature uh, is that theory is used to inform the dynamic specification. So the analyst is saying, I know how many lags of X and Y need to be in the model because it's informed by my theory. Um, and sort of, we, at this point, when we, we want to acknowledge that some people actually do have theories about dynamics. Uh, that is a theory 
about how changes in X propagate into Y, and they use intervention models and transfer function models to test these competing hypotheses. Um, there are cases where there are data generating processes that can be strictly thought of as daily, monthly, or annual data generating processes. There might be one value for a budget in a particular year, or there might be one election that occurs over some interval, um, and certainly uh, there will be one closing price each day. But if you have a theory that informs your dynamic specification, it has to be something about that. Your theory has to be about the relationship between closing prices, not about stock prices in general, because trading happens throughout the day. And in, I, we would sort of say that in most cases, our theories aren't this specific. Most uh, dynamic theories don't have theories about dynamics. And instead, it's common to hear uh, sort of pseudo theories. And, and by pseudo theories, we don't mean this in a pejorative sense, but theories that uh, are not quite theories and, and to call them a theory is slightly misleading, right? So you often hear people say, I've included a lag because last year should affect this year. Uh, and that maybe one lag is usually the right model for the process. And those are reasonable things to expect given you know, the experience one has working with time series data, but that's not strictly speaking a theory and neither of these sort of theories would rule out the possibility that maybe you need additional lags of Y in the model uh, and that two years ago affects the current period or that perhaps even uh, an additional lag needs to be included. Um, so this might lead one to say, well, are we saying the theory has no place in dynamic specification? And uh, the answer is no. Um, Cranmer et al. characterized this uh, sort of usefully by saying that theory can be used to determine what are the feasible lag lengths. So if you have annual data, it might not make sense to uh, begin testing restrictions with 15 years of data. It might, depending on you know, your uh, expertise about whatever that phenomenon is, um, but uh, it's up to you to decide what's a feasible lag length and then choose a specification that encompasses your theory and test restrictions on that model. And that is what is typically viewed as the best practice and the analysis of single time series. You begin with a general model, um, you simplify that model using diagnostics. Uh, in each iteration, testing the residuals to see that the residuals are white noise, and then using standard T and F tests to pare down the model until you arrive at a model that meets two criteria. It is sufficient, as in there don't appear to be any unmodeled dynamics uh, in the residuals, and it's parsimonious in that you haven't included any unnecessary lags. Um, and as far as systematic approaches go, the general to specific approach is typically viewed as better than a specific to general approach where you're building the model from something simple because uh, individual tests that you would use in that process are prone to error and often uh, the residuals uh, from a misspecified model might appear to be white noise in certain uh, circumstances, even in the case of single time series models. So the general model that, uh, that we typically begin with is the autoregressive distributed lag model that includes lags of X and Y. This is the ADL111 model. So one X variable, one lag of the X variable, and one lag of Y. Uh, depending on what you're studying, you may need a more general model that includes additional lags of Y and additional lags of X, but that would have to do with the frequency of your data um, and, and what seems like a feasible lag length. Um, so uh, what the table represents are the restrictions that you can place on this model to get alternative dynamic specifications and the names of those different models. Um, and we would like to politely suggest that these are the models that we should strive to use when we're describing our time series models. Um, the partial adjustment model includes a lag of Y and not a lag of X. Um, so calling this a lag dependent variable model is slightly misleading because it's not a model of the lag dependent variable and the fact that the model includes a lag of the dependent variable is hardly uh, the most interesting part of the model. Um, and using that name also sort of, uh, you know, hides the fact that potentially you need to include uh, lags of X uh, as with the finite distributed lag model and the dead start model. Um, in the last column, you can see the motivations that are typically used for these different specifications. Um, the static model, uh, you're making the assumption that there uh, are no dynamics necessary. Um, the partial adjustment model is sometimes used to control for serial correlation. The finite distributed lag model is used to force uh, exogeneity. 
Um, and often we see situations where people want to uh, allow lag X to be exogenous of Y, but also control for serial correlation. So they use some version of a dead start model. So if we have this uh, sort of best practices for single time series models, why aren't these procedures being followed by time series cross-section analysis? Um, we have some conjectures about this. Uh, one is just that uh, the time series cross-section literature has been more concerned with issues associated with the cross-sections than the time series. So issues related to unit heterogeneity, Clark and Linzer, uh, sort of review the issues associated with the question, should I use fixed effects or random effects? There's the famous paper by Beck and Katz dealing with penaral heteroscedasticity. And we want to make clear that this is not uh, a problem with uh, the time series cross-section literature. These are important questions that need to be asked and addressed, but that the focus on these issues has caused some people to overlook problems associated with dynamic specification. A second issue is that it, there are common procedures that have built-in options for dynamic specification. So uh, the panel corrected standard error procedure in STATA allows you to correct for AR1 serial correlation. There are estimators specifically built for AR1 models. Um, and so people sort of move to apply those models when dealing with uh, dynamic data rather than thinking about alternative specifications that may or may not exist. Uh, and the third is that in, in time series, we have a set of tests that perform well for single time series models, portmanteau tests uh, like Box, Pierce, and Young Box, but the uh, analogs to those tests in the time series cross-section literature don't perform as well. So uh, the questions that this poses are, are, are twofold. First, um, how well do the di diagnostics that exist for time series cross-section models perform? Uh, and given the performance of those diagnostics, can we use the general to specific approach that's commonly used uh, for single time series analysis? So we uh, collected a number of tests associated for, with serial correlation. Um, the key differences among the tests are that uh, often the tests have a specific alternative hypothesis um, so the null is that there's no serial correlation in the residuals against an alternative that there is AR1 serial correlation in the residuals or AR2 serial correlation in the residuals. Um, we list the journal and the number of citations for these tests because it sort of illustrates how often they're used in the literature. Uh, so the Ariano and Bond uh, and the Wooldridge texts have been cited a lot. That's because those are textbooks, not just papers introducing tests for serial correlation. Um, uh, well. Uh, perhaps the Ariano and Bond is not uh, a textbook, so apologies. Um, the Wooldridge test uh, has been applied in Stata uh, by Drucker in, in 2003, uh, but there are also a series of uh, tests with general alternative hypotheses. So um, the idea behind the portmanteau test is that the null is that there's no serial correlation against a general alternative that there is serial correlation at any lag length. Um, so we've highlighted a series of these tests uh, that we're going to include in the simulations just, just to see how well they perform. Um, and so uh, we set up a series of simulations where the variables in the experiments are the number of cross-sections and the number of time points. We just choose sort of a low value and a high value. Uh, and there's a series of data generating processes that we alter uh, by restricting uh, the values of alpha 1, which is the coefficient on lag y, beta naught, which is the coefficient on x, and beta 1, which is the coefficient on lag x, to get uh, either the static model, the partial adjustment model, the finite distributed lag model, or the auto re regressive distributed lag model. We estimate all of those models for each of the data generating processes and then collect the results uh, from the serial correlations test. We also allow uh, the dynamics in uh, the independent and dependent variables to change with sort of moderate to high levels of serial correlation to see how well the test perform. Um, and the results we're going to see here are, show uh, the proportion of a thousand simulations where the p-value from the individual test fell below 0 0.05. Um, the way that I'll talk through the results uh, is in terms of uh, the null and alternative hypothesis. So. Um, whether the null or alternative is true will vary based on the model that's being estimated and the data generating process. The null is true in cases where the model encompasses the DGP and the model is false uh, otherwise. So uh, in the first set of results, uh, in each case, I bold 
the data generating process. So the static model uh, is the data generating process here, which means that the null is true in all of these cases because all of these models uh, encompass uh, the data generating process. So um, uh, we can. Uh, so as you look across, you see the proportion of times that you're uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Um, and generally, the O'Key test is not performing particularly well. The Woolbridge, Vergara, and Vera tests uh, are performing reasonably well uh, in the static model. Um, in the PA model and the ADL11 model, the Woolbridge test is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis isn't true. Um, and the, the OK test is still showing mixed results. In the next set of results, uh, the partial adjustment model, what's sometimes referred to as the lag dependent variable model, um, we have a case where the data generating process includes a lag of Y, uh, and the different models may or may not. So in the case of the static model and the FDL model, the null hypothesis is false because there are dynamics in Y that are not being captured by the model. The Partial adjustment model is true because that is the data generating process. And the ADL11 model, uh, the null hypothesis is also true because we're just including an unnecessary lag of X. Uh, and again, we sort of see mixed results. Um, for the static model and the FDL model, the tests are performing reasonably well other than the O'Key test. We're rejecting the null hypothesis uh, when the null hypothesis is false most of the time. When we look at the situations where the null hypothesis is true, the Wooldridge test is still rejecting the null hypothesis, uh, but the Bugara and the Barra tests um, are sort of working as they should. By increasing the amount of serial correlation, uh, the results are basically the same. Uh, the O'Key test gets close uh, in, the, in the case where the number of cross sections is 25 and T is equal to 100, but still generally underperforms. Uh, next, we consider the case where uh, there is a lag of X in the data generating process, but not a lag of Y. So uh, the sort of top two panels, the null hypothesis is false because there are unmodeled dynamics associated with lag X. The null hypothesis is true in the bottom two panels because the FDL is the correct model. And in the ADL model, we're including an unnecessary lag of Y, but we are including the necessary lag of X. Um, so in this case, uh, the uh, Wooldridge test is again rejecting the null hypothesis uh, when the null is true for the ADL11 model, but it's performing well for the FDL case. Um, and again, uh, the Vergara and Vera models are working well, uh, and the O'Key test is underperforming in most cases. Um, altering the level of serial correlation doesn't radically alter those results, um, but uh, we sort of get slightly different results in the static case. Uh, finally, uh, we have a case where the ADL11 uh, is the data generating process, so the null hypothesis is false. In all the cases, uh, uh, the static model, the PA1 model, and uh, the FDL model. And we see that generally, other than the Vigara test and the PA1 model, we're rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. The Wooldridge test is still rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. We get slightly different results. Uh, when we increase the amount of correlation in X and Y, or sort of memory in X and Y, uh, but uh, the results are sort of consistent across those models. So what have we learned about these tests? Well, uh, the Bogara and Vera tests perform well in most cases, uh, but uh, the Vigara test does not detect serial correlation in the PA1 model when X2 minus 1 should be included, uh, and the Vera test has a similar problem. The Wooldridge test is uh, prone to reject the null, and the O'Key test only seems to perform well when T is greater than the number of cross sections. Um, so if we summarize across uh, all those tests for serial correlation, uh, the number of times that we had a success and a failure. So a success is a case where the test rejected the null hypothesis uh, less than 5% of the time, a, a, a failure uh, is a case where it rejected more than 95% of the time, uh, and we had cases where the null hypothesis was true and the null hypothesis was false. And if we aggregate the results across the different specifications and the different models, we can sort of see a result where, you know, about 50% of the time uh, we're rejecting the null hypothesis uh, when the null hypothesis is true and we're failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false uh, about 60% of the time. Uh, and, and so the conclusion then is that these tests for serial correlation don't perform uh, particularly well. 
Uh, and so any dynamic specification process that required, uh, that, that relied too heavily on those tests might be prone to failure. Uh, the uh, general to specific approach mentioned uh, prior makes use of those tests but does not rely on them solely. It also uses uh, information criteria to determine uh, what the appropriate uh, model is. So we would like to know then as well how often to common information criteria, the AIC and the BIC, select the correct model. So in uh, the next set of simulations, uh, in, in each iteration, we uh, uh, calculate the AIC and the BIC. Uh, we identify the minimum AIC and BIC for each model in each iteration, and then store the name of that model. Uh, and we'll look at the percentage of times that the AIC and the BIC uh, chose the correct model. So in the static case, the AIC uh, is correct is selecting the correct model most of the time. The BIC is not. The BIC is prone to selecting uh, an un a model that includes an unnecessary lag of X, um, but that wouldn't necessarily generate bias. Um, and the PA model, uh, the results improve. Again, the AIC uh, is uh, selecting the correct model most of the time, and the BIC is selecting the model uh, almost all of the time. Uh, the FDL model, there's slightly worse performance, but uh, we're still getting the correct answer most of the time. And the ADL11 model, the BIC is still outperforming the AIC. So um, the modal model in both cases, um, the modal model in both cases uh, is, is the correct model. And the PIC uh, performs uh, particularly well when lag Y is something that's included uh, in the model, um, not necessarily uh, in the case of the FDL. So having established the performance of the information criteria and the test for serial correlation, we can compare these alternative strategies for dynamic specification that we've mentioned. And so um, a dynamic strategy is character, or a specification strategy is characterized uh, by the sort of reasons that one chooses candidate models and the termination criteria uh, they use to determine whether or not the correct model has been selected. Um, so in the case of theory, in the case of whether one is including lag Y to control for serial correlation, lag X to impose exogeneity or combination of those two things, uh, we would hope that at least the analyst is testing for serial correlation after imposing uh, these sort of uh, mod these dynamic uh, specifications on the data. Uh, and if so, they would uh, sort of de decide that that was the best approach uh, if they found that there was no evidence of serial correlation. Um, in the specific to general approach, you uh, build the model from a uh, sort of static model until you find a model where there's no serial correlation. Um, and in the general to specific approach, uh, you uh, pare down the model as mentioned pri uh, previously until you find a model that is sufficient uh, and has the best fit. So um, the, the, the last thing we sort of say is that, you know, at, at this point we have computers and it's uh, sort of trivial uh, as is sort of illustrated by uh, the uh, simulations to just estimate all of the models uh, and compare them to determine uh, which models are sufficient candidate models and which of those models fit best. Um, so here's an example of how uh, we came to this process. Uh, the data generating process here is an ADL11 model where uh, their uh, row X and row Y are equal to 0.9 um, and the sample size is 625, 25 cross sections, 25 time points. Uh, we estimate uh, all the different models, calculate all the tests, uh, and compare uh, the information criteria. Um, so if I was including lag Y to control for serial correlation, I would fail to get the correct model because I might find evidence based on the Vigara and Vera tests that uh, there was no serial correlation in my data uh, when there were serial correlation. In this case, alternatively, if I was including lag X, um, I, I would find that there is serial correlation uh, in my residuals uh, and so that there might be a problem with my dynamic specification. But if I tried to do both of those things at the same time, uh, I would arrive at the incorrect specification. Any number of the dead start models uh, appear to have well-behaved residuals. Um, if I build from a specific model to the general model, I, of course, would stop uh, at the PA1 model. Uh, but if I go from general to specific, or I compare all of the models, I arrive at the correct model based on both the test for serial correlation. Uh, and among all of the models where there did not appear to be serial correlation in the residuals, uh, this the ADL11 model in this case has the lowest AIC and BIC. So this, this procedure doesn't rely on any individual criterion, but instead 
uh, sort of uses the preponderance of evidence to uh, uh, select the correct model. So the final set of results is just a comparison of, of those strategies across all the specifications that we've identified. So what we just looked at was uh, the ABL11 case where row X and row Y were equal to 0.5, um, but we again vary the number of cross sections and the number of time points. And what we consistently see uh, in the ABL11 case uh, is that uh, test for serial correlation, uh, test for serial correlation and exogeneity and the specific to general modeling strategy will fail, while the general to specific modeling approach uh, sort of uh, always arrives uh, at, at the correct model. Uh, the same is true um, for the partial adjustment model. Um, and, uh, well, so actually in this case, uh, the test for exogeneity, uh, sort of the, the you, you get a failure when you're trying to do both. Um, we, we see a lot more failure uh, in the case of the FDL model. Uh, test for serial correlation will often cause us to choose uh, incorrect uh, dynamic specifications. Um, but again, the general specific model approach works. And if you were to just estimate all feasible dynamic specifications and test those restrictions, you would likely arrive uh, at the correct model. Um, so what can we conclude then? Um, even though the individual tests for serial correlation uh, for uh, TSCS data are unreliable, the best practices used for dynamic specification of single time series models can be applied to time series cross-section models. Uh, as long as the analyst is capable of exercising sort of a reasonable amount of judgment and weighing competing pieces of information. Um, our point would be uh, one should not rely too much on any one test or one information criterion, but use uh, sort of a host of models and, and look at the sort of preponderance of evidence. Um, the general to specific modeling strategy outperforms the common approaches that we see in the TSCS literature. Um, but a feasible alternative approach would just to be estimate all of the feasible models and compare uh, the alternatives. Uh, moving forward, uh, we sort of want to incorporate questions of unit heterogeneity, cross-sectional dynamic heterogeneity. Um, these problems are also very prevalent in the binary time series cross-section literature. Um, and there's sort of relevant questions here associated with the way we interpret panel unit root tests. And I suppose I would say in conclusion as well that um, you know, sometimes these talks are exercises in empirical nihilism where we're telling you that there are things that you can't do. And in this case, we think it's quite the opposite. Instead, um, we think that you can be free to focus on politics, to focus on your theories about the relationships between X and Y, if you're willing to acknowledge that your theory can't tell you things about dynamic specification and instead apply the procedures that exist to identify the correct dynamic specifications. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I'm uh, ready for questions. All right. Well, thank you, Clayton, for uh, for that presentation. Um, at this point, uh, Clayton Webb's available to take questions from the audience. I have several. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button. It's the bottom of the webinar window. Uh, several questions have been asked about where the heck are the slides, and so. We're going to post uh, the link uh, for a download for the slides uh, as soon as possible and let everybody know um, where to find them. Um, I, I guess, uh, given your talk, I, there's no substitute for good theory <laughs> in, in terms of structuring your legs, right? Uh, it, it seems like the, the tests are a little iffy at times. Um, but um, if you're really confident in the way in which you have um, theorized your lag structure, uh, would you just say you ought to be comfortable with that and move ahead or, you know, look around at the edges uh, to see, well, maybe maybe I can add this little lag here too. Uh, so I think uh, what the results suggest is that while the test individually might not perform well, that's actually a reason not to try and lead uh, with theory in terms of your dynamic specification, um, because what we'll be prone to do is say that I have a good theory about how many lags of Y and X I should include in the model, and I'll test my model with diagnostics to determine whether or not uh, this was sort of the correct specification. Um, and if we were really confident in our theory, we would of course be prone uh, to accept the results from the test that were consistent with that idea. Um, and so in instead, I would say, uh, one should use their theory to find 
a feasible set of lags for X and Y, uh, should test restrictions on those and sort of compare the different dynamic specifications rather than, than leading with one theory. So it's not that theory uh, should be removed from the process entirely, uh, but I, I, I think that the results sort of suggest that we should be wary of any one who focuses too much on theory for dynamic specifications. Okay, one of the questions that's been asked by uh, Greg Petro says, uh, are you correct that you that the tests all require panel data? Yes, in this case, all the tests require uh, panel data, but there are analogs uh, that are sort of uh, implemented for single time series models. Okay. Uh, Catherine Ray's Householder asks, uh, and this is a lengthy question, but it goes right to the heart of what you've been discussing, uh, which is, what would you do in cases one, where when your theory expects serial correlation, but the tests show that there is no serial correlation? Or secondly, when your theory does not expect serial correlation, but the tests do show serial correlation, what, wh where are you left? So, um, the, 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 there, there's two points to consider there. Um, one, uh, I, I'm assuming uh, when you say that your theory expects serial correlation, that you'd be saying that uh, perhaps a feasible sort of lag links would be to include a single lag of X and a single lag of Y because I have annual data. But when I estimate the model, I don't find that lag Y or lag X is statistically significant. Um, and so uh, this gets back to this question about um, you, you might believe uh, that X is prior to Y or that there is a, a lag structure that seems reasonable to you, um, but it's really a matter of how the data are measured. Um, to say that uh, my theory tells me that I have uh, an AR1 specification with annual data, then what you're really saying is that there's some change in the independent variable and we should not expect to observe any change in the dependent variable until uh, 12 months at a minimum uh, and no later than 24 months. And most theories are just not that specific. Um, and so uh, I, I think the, the, the point, the takeaway point I would say here is that um, your theory shouldn't necessarily be telling you uh, to expect serial correlation or not expect serial correlation but you may have some intuition based on how your data are measured about what a feasible uh, lag length is. Uh, but that's not necessarily a theory about the lag length. Okay. One of our uh, attendees asked if it would be possible to go through maybe a small substantive example uh, to give a better sense of uh, what, what your test might be able to tell you with, with some confidence. And do you have anything in mind? There's also a, a, a note that your presentation, you spoke very fast, and I don't think everybody had all the slides, and so it was a little difficult to follow at times. But do you have, a, do you have an example in mind that, uh, that, that would demonstrate, you know, a substantive example that might demonstrate uh, uh, the merit of, uh, of the checks that, you, that you're proposing, the, the test? Uh, sure. So. Um, something that, if, if you were interested, and sort of an obs obscure example, but I think it really highlights this point. Um, if you were interested uh, in the way people, uh, or the way countries develop uh, agricultural protections over time, uh, and you had annual data, you might say to yourself uh, something like, well, last year's protection should affect this year's protection. So, uh, including a lag seems reasonable, or you might say something like, I need to control for serial correlation, so I need to include a lag of Y. Um, and even though you have annual data and there's a sense uh, in, in uh, sort of international political economy and comparative political economy that uh, single lag structures are appropriate in these cases, uh, in this case, it really wouldn't be. Um, if you think about the United States case, we don't alter our tariffs uh, or our agricultural policies on an annual basis. So there's not a sort of budget type process where we return to this every year. Instead, there's sort of four to five year lags between when we alter uh, the sort of substance of our agricultural policies. Um, and so uh, if you try to impose 
a sort of annual dynamic structure on a political process that happens and starts and fits over longer periods of time, um, then uh, you'll you'll sort of you know, run into problems. Um, and if you start with a general enough model and sort of new, know, use what you know about the way agricultural policy is, is used in the United States, you can test these assumptions that you have uh, about that process. Okay. Uh, somebody noted that they read uh, one of your papers, uh, one of the PolMath meetings on cross-sectional dynamic heterogeneity in which mixed effects models were used to address uh, the issue. And so the question is, uh, this person guesses that uh, maximum likelihood estimator was used there. So are there panel tests for, uh, are these panel tests for serial, serial correlation also applicable to models estimated under MLE? Uh, yes, they are. Um, so uh, they would not necessarily be applicable for cases where you had limited dependent variables. So uh, I'm not sure how they perform if you have binary time series cross-section data or count models, but um, as long as you have a continuous outcome, then you can use uh, sort of a normal model, either you know a normal distribution model uh, to calculate a residual, uh, you know, a, a Y hat based on your model, compare that to Y, you get a residual, and then you can use these tests to test those uh, residuals as well. All right. So Jessica Jones asks uh, whether or not you've performed simulations with uh, less lengthy time series. Uh, in other words, the those cases that fall into the gray space where C is greater than T, but T is large enough and the process is known to be autoregressive. Um, uh, have you run any of those and were the results the same or are there other issues that appear that uh, one has to be careful of? Um, so certainly, and, and this is a, a thread that's common across these uh, articles um, that identify uh, the test for serial correlation that uh, the test performance depend on the asymptotics in terms of is it the number of cross sections, is it the number of time points that's increasing, is the number of cross sections relative to time points. Um, in the case here, uh, I sort of think of the short time periods as being uh, 100 cross sections, but 25 time points or 25 cross sections and 25 time points. Um, I have uh, performed them with shorter panels, um, but the, the findings uh, are sort of consistent in the sense that, um, you know, for certain tests, uh, they perform poorly uh, when you only have 25 time points and they'll perform even worse when you have fewer time points. Um, and there are tests that exist that uh, work better for those types of data, um, but the sort of takeaway is, again, to not be too reliant on any of the individual tests. But moving forward, uh, I suppose we could also incorporate, uh, you know, a, a much smaller number of time points, five or 10, to sort of see again, maybe benchmark these tests for different structures. All right. Well, Greg, Greg uh, Petro asks, uh, well, he says that his time series is a little rusty. He, he has no idea. Mine is really rusty. But he says that he recalls that Durbin-Watson tests are popular and often used for serial correlation. And if so, uh, how does that test perform relative to the things you've been uh, talking about? So I believe, and I just want to go back to make sure that I don't misquote this, but the Vagara test uh, is a Durbin-Watson type test being applied for time series cross-section data. So the results presented here are sort of the performance of the Durbin-Watson, and uh, there are other sort of modifications of the Durbin-Watson test that have been applied that just aren't being uh, used here. Oh, great. Uh, if there are other questions, if someone wants to jump in right now would be a good time. Um, if not, we'll try and track down the slides and post that uh, later. I apologize for that not being here. Um, otherwise, any anything else that you'd like to add, Clayton? You've said it all. I've said it all, yeah. <laughs> that was great. This is a nice introduction. The slides are very useful, so I hope to get those posted uh, at, at some point soon. Um, I, I suppose I would ask uh, anybody in the audience and, and, and yourself as well, um, 
you know, the simulations are a bit cumbersome because there's so many variables and, and it's not clear, uh, you know, how many different numbers of cross sections, how many different time points uh, should we include? Um, because, you know, as you can imagine with all these permutations, it gets pretty cumbersome to do, but also to summarize. And so uh, if anyone has any suggestions on, you know, uh, how to limit the amount of information or specific things that they would like to see added to the simulations to make the case more compelling. Um, I'd, I'd really like to know what those are. Well, I, I think Jessica's question sort of gets at a problem that uh, most political scientists have. Our time series are relatively short. We don't have terribly lengthy things for some of the issues that we want to focus on. So that might be a useful um, uh, thing to um, uh, focus on, you know, what happens when when uh, when C is greater than T, and um, and that T is kind of good enough, but not quite. And uh, I think this may be a common problem that most of us face who use this. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, Greg just sent in a note and says, "Yeah, short time series. You bet, like three or four. <laughs> Which really, you know, uh, it's a real problem for all of us, I think, uh, who, who might want to apply this. And so maybe uh, those, those simulations could, could cast some light on, on what some of the serious problems might be. Yeah. Well, I think help? in the case of three or four times serious, the better approach is to try and ignore time altogether and, mm -hmm. and use something like time fixed effects or, uh, you know, because there's just not enough variation there uh, for you to estimate. Um, you know, a dynamic model with any um, credibility. So I think in those cases, trying to treat time as, as flat as you can. Um, but, uh, you know, if your pooling assumptions uh, are sort of met, then even with eight, nine time points, um, you can borrow information in sort of a, a useful way. Yeah, Catherine uh, Ray's Householder points out that the same issue comes up time and again with a small number of countries. So, uh, you know, it is it is a real problem. One of the other attendees uh, asked whether you could simulate models with interaction terms uh, in which X interacts with the lag Ys. Given any thought to that? I have given thought to that. Um, it's not something I'm doing in this project. Um, but I do think it's potentially something important for this project, maybe perhaps not an interaction necessarily, but uh, in the following sense. So um, when do we expect to observe serial correlation in the residuals due to omitted X? Um, if lag Y is correlated with lag X and you uh, omit lag X, um, that should produce sort of systematic changes in Y and it might depending on how the data journeying process works, uh, it, it could have more or less of an effect. So I think that is probably something we should incorporate, though I don't know um, the, the extent to which one wants to make inferences about interacting lag Y uh, with some of the independent variables um, is beyond the scope of this paper, but a, an interesting question that uh, sort of looked at in different uh, situations. Uh, Jessica Jones suggests uh, maybe looking at something with interrupted time series and how you'd model that out and how the tests perform um, in the presence of interruptions that uh, where you know the time slice, which the interruption appeared, and then trying to estimate, I guess, lag structures around on each side. And one of the attendees asked where the approach can be useful when using fixed or random effects. Um, so the approach uh, can be used uh, for both models of fixed and random effects. Um, the thing to keep in mind uh, with fixed effects models is that, uh, you know, if you limit um, what you're doing to the variation with the units, uh, you're prone to um, bias if you don't have sufficiently long time series and nickel bias. Uh, but, um, you know, whether as, as long as the unobserved heterogeneity that you're interested in modeling with random and fixed effects is not uh, sort of uh, a correlated with longer lags of X and Y, um, it shouldn't create problems. Though, I mean, as I say that, 
you know, that's just another way of saying you need to include all the lags of X and Y that need to be in the model. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing about these, uh, the, the procedure uh, that changes if you have fixed or random effects. And some of the tests uh, that are mentioned here, uh, the O'Key test and uh, the paper by Dew in 2014, I think those are explicitly about uh, finding um, tests for serial correlation and fixed effects models, or in in in, you in Salon in 2006 as well. Oh, great. Uh, any other questions? If not, uh, that's all the time we have for this week's uh, IMC. I'd really like to thank Clayton Webb for being our presenter this week. Uh, his presentation will be posted to our website shortly after the broadcast. So if you'd like to share this uh, presentation or watch it again later, you certainly can. And I think at the same time, we'll ensure that the uh, slides are, are posted as well. So you can see those. Uh, next week, uh, Friday, February 16th, we'll host a talk uh, from Mark Pickup of Simon Fraser University. You can go to the website, uh, methods-colloquium.com to get more information about this talk, and we'll certainly be sending um, messages out uh, over the web to everybody who's been attending routinely. Uh, We'll see you next week. You won't see me. Justin will be back and things will go much more smoothly, I'm sure. Thanks again, Clayton. Appreciate it.